Hello everyone. Today we had quiz number three, so hopefully that's finished. We cover composition and inverse functions, which are these sections in your book. You should be working on project three, which is due at whatever date you see here in this next row. So let's go ahead and get started. We have two main topics for today, composition of functions and inverse functions. We have briefly seen these topics already this semester. Today we go into a bit more depth. Number two. Suppose R gives a farmer's revenue as a function of corn yield per acre, and Y gives the corn yield per acre as a function of the quantity Q of fertilizer. What does R of Y of Q represent? What would we need to know to evaluate it? Okay, so the one thing we uh, should know about in, um, composition of functions is that we're supposed to work from the inside to the outside. So looking at the innermost thing here, we start with an input of Q which is uh, the quantity of fertilizer. And then working from the inside out, the next thing that I see here is Y of Q. And Y of Q gives me the corn yield per acre. So Y of Q is the corn yield per acre. And then working inside out again, we finally get to handle R. And R is going to take this um, corn yield per acre and give us the revenue as a function of corn yield per acre. So the input is the quantity Q of fertilizer, and the output is the revenue. So given a quantity of fertilizer, this entire function right here gives you the revenue. Given a quantity of fertilizer, this function gives the revenue. Notice that we haven't written anything about corn yield per acre. It appears here and it appears here. It is represented by the function y. And it's just an intermediary. And so it doesn't really get written down in this problem. We're given some quantity of fertilizer. The ultimate output is revenue, even though in the uh, middle step, um, the corn yield per acre pops up. Number three, in general, f of g of t, sometimes written f circle g of t, is the composition of f with g, defined by using the output of g as the input of f. So we said this before, but um, the basic idea with these, with the composition of functions, is to work from the inside to the outside. So if you had this, you would work first g of t, and then finally f. Same thing for the, uh, for written over here. Number four, suppose you are given the graphs of f and g, they're here in the picture, the dark blue line, the thick blue line is f, and the thin red line is g. We want to find g of f of 4, and then we want to find g of f of 5. So pause the video here, find those two numbers, and come back when you're done. Okay, so let's see how we did. First one, g of f of 4. So f of 4, we're going to go to the number 4. We're going to go to the f function, which is the thick blue one. So that number right there must be f of 4, which is the um, inside part. So this is really g of, and then I'm going to write in blue, sorry, in green, 2. f of 4 is really 2. And now if I want to find g of 2, and we can go in black here to the number 2, and then we go to the g curve, which is the red one, and it takes us all the way up to the top. And then we had left, and we find over here that g of 2 is really 5. So our ultimate answer here is 5. Started with 4, ended up going to 2, and then ultimately going to 5. Same idea now with g of f of 5. So let's try this one in purple. So first thing we do is f of 5. We go to 5. We go to the f curve, which is blue. We land here, find the y-axis. And in this case, we see that f of 5 is 1. So this problem is really asking us to find g of 1. And then to find g of 1, um, I'll do this one in, uh, what can we do here? I guess we can do red. g is red. So we go to 1, we go to the g curve, which is red. The left, and we find that g of 1 is really 4. So ultimately, this is 4. Next step here, then plot these points and begin to sketch the graph of y equals g of f of x. So let's go ahead and write these two points that we just found up above as ordered pairs. 
So in this first point, uh, it was g of f of 4. What was the value of x? It was 4. And then what was the output of the function, which we're going to call the y value? The final output was 5. Even though 2, that green number, was an intermediate, it wasn't the final answer, so it doesn't get recorded. So that's the point 4, 5. Go ahead and write down the point for the uh, second piece. Write down this as an ordered pair. Hopefully we get 5, 4. And so we can plot these two points. Let's see, 4, 5 is way up here. 5, 4 is here. And then you could plot a bunch more points if you wanted to. Now, does it go on a straight line from here to here? I don't know. I kind of need a little more information. Um, plotting composition of functions is generally a hard thing to do, and plotting points is just about the only technique I can give you. Um, so uh, you could plot a lot of points and eventually have a good-looking graph of uh, y equals g of f of x. Number five, often we will want to decompose a function as a composition of two or more functions. This will be very useful in calculus. When doing this, think about the order of operations and use the thing we do first as the inside function. For each function below, find two functions, f and g, such that h of x is equal to f of g of x. Okay, so let's look at part a. h of x is e to the 2x plus 1, but I really want to write h of x as a composition of two other functions, hopefully two simpler functions. So let's see, we're going to write f of x, and we're going to write g of x, and the idea is to work from the inside to the outside, and the hint is that whatever you do first is going to be the inside function. And the inside function in this setup is g. So what would we do first if we were trying to evaluate this e to the 2x plus 1? For example, if I said, how much is h of 4? What would we do? We'd put 4 right up there for the x, and we'd calculate this number. If you plug 4 in for x, that turns out to be 9. So you would do the 2x plus 1 first. So it seems like that's the hint is telling us to put that as the inside function. And then what would you do? Well, you would take e and raise it to whatever number you just got. Whatever number you just got, well, it's just x in general. So we've taken the 2x plus 1, that exponent, we've separated it out. And then we've just got these two simpler functions, e to the x and 2x plus 1. And as a check, this is probably worth doing at least the first time, what I'd really like to do is verify that f of g of x is the original function. So let's see, inside to the outside. So we're just going to copy the g of x function in here. g of x, we said, was 2x plus 1. And now how much is f of 2x plus 1? Well, f is a function which just takes x, whatever's in the parentheses, and puts it up there on top of an e. So whatever's in the parentheses gets put on top of an e. e to the whatever's in the parentheses. And lo and behold, this e to the 2x plus 1 is exactly the original function. Okay, so um, there are other ways to write uh, part A here as a composition of two functions, and I'll show you two others in a moment. But before we do, let's try part B using the same ideas as part A. Pause the video and try to find two functions, f and g, so that this function, this h of x function, is really f of g of x. And then come back when you're done. Okay, so hopefully we put the inner function as the g. The inner function to me looks like 3 ln of x plus 2, the entire inside. That's not the only way to do it, but that's my natural reaction, so I'll do that. And then square root of x. And so whether you wrote those particular functions or two different functions, I'd encourage you to pause the video now and check, just like we did right up here, and see if you actually get... Uh, the square root of 3 ln of x plus 2 when you compose the two functions you wrote. So I'll pause the video and come back when you're ready. Okay, so hopefully uh, either you found that what you wrote down worked, or if it didn't work, you found out or you discovered something about why it didn't work. So I said that um, there are other ways to answer these questions. So for example, here's an, an alternative. I'll just do it for the bottom function. So alternatively, we could have done this. Whoops. We could have said that the inner function is really 3 ln of x. No plus 2. Just 3 ln of x. 
And if you're going to do a little bit less work on the G function, then you got to make up for it. You got to pay for it by making the F function work harder. So in this case, the F function turns out to be square root of X plus two. And so you can verify that. Go ahead and do that check to see that when you compose those two functions in red, you still get the original function. Pause the video and come back once you've done that. Okay, so hopefully we saw that that worked. And now I'm going to give you this one last option, which I never want you to use. You will get zero credit for doing this on a quiz or a test. You could make one function do all of the work. Let's say that g of x is the entire function as it was originally. And then you can make the other function incredibly lazy. f of x equals x does nothing. But you could verify and check that, uh, in fact, if you do f of g of x for these two functions, then you'll get the original. So it works. In fact, you might ask yourself, how many different ways are there to decompose any given function? There are lots. We've got three of them up here. Please, please, please don't do this one. It's not helpful, and it's certainly not going to um, get you anywhere when you are doing this for real in a calculus class. Number six. You can look up these symbols in your book if you aren't familiar with them. F plus G, F minus G, F times G, and F divided by G. We move on to inverse functions. Consider the two functions F and G defined by F of X equals X cubed plus 1 and G of X equals cube root of X minus 1. If we take the composition of these two functions in each order, we get, all right, so we're just going to look at one of these in detail, but take a look here. We're starting with F circle G, which means F of G of X, work from the inside to the outside. And so if you had F of G of X, what you would do is you would copy the F, so I'm just going to circle here in green. The F is just sitting out there on the outside waiting for you to handle what's inside. What's inside is G of X, I'll put it in a box, and all we've done is copied G of X right here in this box. That is the g of x function uh, for this example. And then the tough part is to apply f to that thing in the parentheses. We're trying to find f of this stuff in the box here. So f is a function which takes whatever you give it, it cubes it, and then it adds 1. So it takes whatever we gave it, cubes it, and adds 1. We'll put this thing here in the box again just so you see it's still blah cubed plus 1. But then good things happen. If you cube, this cube root, the cube and the cube root are opposites. They're, they're inverses of each other and they cancel. And so we just get x minus 1 for this entire thing right here. And then there's the plus 1 sitting on the outside. And then the minus 1 and the plus 1 are also inverses. They cancel each other and we just get x. So let's look at what happened here. Here's our summary. f circle g of x. And all is said and done turned out to be x. So the input was x, then you went through a whole lot of stuff, and the output was eventually x. So f and g undo each other. g took the number x someplace, but then f took it right back to x. Started with x, ended with x. That's the definition of inverse functions. So these two functions right here are inverse functions. Now it turns out it's not enough to only do the one order. We did f of g. You also have to do g of f. So I'd encourage you to pause the video here and read through this calculation, or maybe better yet, cover that calculation up and see if you can recreate it, and then come back when you're done. So hopefully we saw that uh, g of f of x went to some place, but eventually came right back to the x that it started with. Again, that's the definition of inverse functions. Next page. Thus, these two functions undo each other. If we plug the output of g, g of x, into f, we get back our original input, x. Start with x, end with x. Two functions which undo each other in this way are called inverse functions. The inverse function of f can be written as f to the minus 1. Now, it looks like a power. It is not a power. It is the symbol for inverse. So please don't confuse that with a power. It doesn't mean the reciprocal of f. It doesn't mean 1 over f. It is not a power. It is the symbol that we use to denote inverse. Number seven, some basic facts about inverses that you should know. Pause the video here, take your time and read through these things. And if you have any, um, any questions about what any of these things mean, take a look at your book or send me an email or something. Um, but read through those five things and hopefully everything makes sense. 
and come back when you're done. Okay, lots of stuff to digest in there, but hopefully you've seen most, if not all of it before. Moving on to number eight, let's make sure we're comfortable finding the inverse of a function algebraically. Here's the process. So the steps for finding the inverse of a function are written out here. Uh, over here is the example that we're gonna do. We're gonna find the inverse of this function and we're gonna do all the work here, going side by side with the steps. Okay, step one, check that the function is one to one. So hopefully you know what this means, but essentially it means that um, no y value comes from two different x values. I'll say it again, no y value comes from two different x values. Oftentimes it's kind of hard to check whether or not that's true. Uh, here's an example of a function that is not one to one. Since uh, f of two is two squared, that's four, and f of negative two, that's negative two squared is also four. So we have a one y value coming from two different x values. That function is not one to one which means that x squared does not have an inverse. So it's oftentimes quite hard to do. Um, one thing you could do uh, is maybe think about graphing that function. This is a tough function, so maybe we'll use the calculator to help us, but we can type this into the y equals. Okay, what happened here? 2x minus one. Okay, so I'm not really sure where this function lives, so maybe zoom six will get us started. Okay, is that function one-to-one? -one? How do I know by looking at the picture? Well, we said that we wanted to make sure that we never had the same y value coming from two different x's. If you think about what that means, uh, let's just take a quick pause here and draw the video of, uh, sorry, draw the, uh, the graph of y equals x squared. And we have this point over here. This is the point two comma four. And then the other point in question was negative two four. Those are the two we wrote in blue just below. Right, that's these ones right here. And so what goes wrong here? Or how do we know by looking at a picture that uh, something goes wrong? Well, there's a horizontal line that hits the curve in two different spots, two different points. That's exactly what went wrong. And that's what we're talking about when we say this horizontal line test. So the graph here, this parabola, fails the horizontal line test because there's a line that hits the graph in more than one point. So what I'm really hoping, if I want to verify that a function is one-to-one, -one, I want to make sure there's no horizontal line that hits the graph twice or more. So taking a look at the graph of this complicated function here, is there any horizontal line that hits the graph more than once? So you can imagine a line up here, and it looks like it hits the graph there, you can ignore this. This is the vertical asymptote. It's not technically part of the graph, but the calculator is doing its best to draw something that represents infinity. It's there. Um, so that horizontal line hits the graph only once. Again, we're ignoring this. There's a different horizontal line. How many times does it hit the graph? Just the once, maybe right around there. Oops, horizontal line a little bit lower. And you could imagine drawing all these horizontal lines. Maybe there's a horizontal line that kind of it's both over here and over here, like if I, if I zoom out a little bit, but ignoring that possibility, none of these horizontal lines are gonna be problems because they only hit the curve once. Again, we're ignoring this vertical line. You can zoom out as much as you want. It turns out there's a horizontal asymptote right there at that gap. And this bottom piece never hits the horizontal asymptote or gets above it. And this top one never hits the horizontal asymptote or gets below. So there's no problem at all. This function is one-to-one. -one by looking at the graph. So we can just write that. And I guess technically we can't really say that definitively it's one-to-one -one because the graph might be misleading. Maybe if we zoomed out more, we'd see it's not one-to-one. -one. But our best assumption at this point is that it is one-to-one -one by looking at that visual evidence. 
So now we dive into the process of finding the inverse. So now we're here at step two. It says replace f of x by y. So we're just going to copy that guy, but change the f of x to a y. So this is what we're calling step two. And then we'll move on to step three. It says interchange or swap the x and the y. So step three is this y becomes an x and the x becomes a y. And so does this x down here. Every x becomes a y. So far, so good. Step four is the doozy. Solve the new equation for y. These are the steps that undo the original function f. So this is the toughest part by far. Sometimes, often, this step is impossible. Anything I give you, it will be possible. But it's really hard to solve um, the original equation for y most of the time. So first thing I'm going to do is take this equation right here, and we're going to cross multiply, or I guess just multiply both sides by y plus 3 to get that uh, fraction to go away. So it goes x times y plus 3 is equal to 2y minus 1. The difficulty here, we're trying to solve for y. It's always the goal, solve for y. Um, the difficulty here is that y appears in two different places. So the process that we're going to follow to get it so that the y appears in only one place, distribute here. Then we'll bring any term with y in it to this side and any term without y in it to the other side. Let's see if we can do that. Distributing the x. And now we want all the y terms on one side. I'll move them to the right. And all the non-y terms on the other side, we'll move them to the left. And we'll do this by adding and subtracting. So we're going to take the 3x. It's good over here on the left. We're going to add the 1. I don't want that minus 1 on the right-hand side. The 2y stays here, and we're going to subtract the xy. So now all the terms with y in it are on one side, and all the terms without y are on the other side. If you don't see where this is going, that's perfectly understandable. The whole reason for doing that is this moment right here. What can we do on the right-hand side? I've got y, I've got y. I can factor that y out. And that right there is the whole reason we were getting the y terms to one side and the non-y terms to the other, is so that you can factor the y out. And in doing so, you took a problem that had two different y's and turned it into a problem that has a single y. And we can solve for this single y. All we need to do is divide by 2 minus x. So that's the hard part. That's step four. We have solved for y. Um, number five is easy. Step five is up here. It says replace y with f inverse of x. So we will do that now. And that's it. 3x plus 1 over 2 minus x is the inverse function. Technically, we should do this check here in step six. It says check to see that f of f inverse of x is really x, and then the other direction as well. We're not going to do that here, at least I'm not going to do that here, but it might not be a bad idea for you to do it here, um, uh, maybe before you move on to the activity, which is on the next page. So that's how we find the inverse of a function algebraically. It can be a fairly straightforward process. Most of the time, it is a very complicated or impossible process, but process I think is written out pretty clearly here in these steps. Okay, so that's the end of this class video. Take your time. There is a significant activity beginning on the next page. Work through it. There are a whole bunch of problems and only after you've given it a good try, uh, maybe go ahead and check out the video of me working through the activity on YouTube.